Hey everybody, our video lecture on topic 1.3 is going to focus on India and kingdoms that arise in Southeast Asia. And as you can see, we have quite the span of years here. We're going to start with some background, going back to as early as 1500 BCE, and work our way up through a few empires, ending up with around 1025 CE. Before we dive too far into our empire discussion, we do need to take a look at the Vedic age in India. After the demise of the Indus Valley Civilization, which was one of the original River Valley Civilizations, Indo-European warriors migrated into India. And what we know is they were organized in patriarchal families and kinship groups. After 1000 BCE, they continued to migrate south and they actually were using iron tools at this time. But what we know is that there was a struggle between these people who were called Arya and then the native Indians called Dasas. And the struggle ended up with the Arya being the victors. And this is what led to a system um, that would be referred to as the Jati system, also called the caste system. And caste is actually a Portuguese word for color. And that's what the basis of this conflict was. It was based on the color of, the, of skin between Aryas and Dasas. Um, the conclusion of this conflict ended up with the Aryas taking control over the subcontinent of India. Um, and this led to the development of Varna, Again, another word that means color, but it's the equivalent to class. And under this system, people were born into one of four varna. You had your priests and scholars, your warriors, your merchants, and then your peasants and laborers. And there was actually a fifth group called the untouchables, and they were born outside the system. And they were called this because they did work that was considered to be demeaning or ritually polluting. And that was work that involved contact with dead bodies of people or animals. So the four Varna were then subdivided into hereditary occupational groups called Jati, again, caste. Um, but the Jati were arranged in an order of hierarchy. And here's the thing, guys, there were very complex rules that govern the appropriate occupation, deities, duties, rituals, and even social interaction between each jati and it this would this still goes on this has been a system that governed the interaction of people and it wasn't even just speaking it was even walking on the same path walking on the same road and the systems of varna and jati were rationalized by the belief in reincarnation and according to this belief each individual has an immortal spirit it's called the atman and that immortal spirit will be reborn to another body after death. And one station in the next life depended on one's actions in this and previous lives. This is called karma. The Vedic religion emphasized the worship of male deities through sacrifice. Religious knowledge and practice was the monopoly of the priestly class. They memorized rituals, prayers, and hymns, and may have opposed the introduction of writing to maintain their monopoly on religious knowledge, which was the Brahmin class. We don't know a lot about the status or roles of women in the Vedic period. They could study lore and participate in rituals. They could own land, and they married in their middle or late teens. Now, pressure from new religious movements would actually lead to a reform of the old Vedic religion. Buddhism in particular, especially after it became the dominant religion of the Mauryan Empire by Ashoka, led to more and more people leaving the Vedic faith. And thus the reform began. And as a result of this form, the foundational elements of the Vedic religion incorporated the intense personal religious devotion, fertility rituals, and symbolism of the Southern Dravidian cultures, as well as some elements of Buddhism. And sacrifice became less important and the role of personal devotion to the gods increased. And as a result of this reform, two formerly minor Vedic deities took the places of honor in Hindu in the Hindu faith. These deities were Vishnu, the preserver, Jiva, the destroyer. Also prominent in new religious tradition was the goddess Devi. These and all the other countless gods and goddesses were understood to be manifestations of a single divine force. Hindu worship centered on temples and shrines. 
and it also included service to gods and goddesses as well as pilgrimages. The religious duties of an individual varied according to gender, social status, and age. And the transformation from Vedic religion to Hinduism was so successful that Hinduism became the dominant religion of India. It appealed to the common people's need for personal gods with whom they could have a direct connection with. Theravada Buddhism was too austere to have popular appeal, and Mahayana Buddhism was so close to Hinduism that its beliefs were quite easily absorbed by the larger, more popular Hinduism. And finally, Hinduism also helped to solidify the idea that there was an India, an entity in which there existed broadly shared, or at least broadly recognized, religious traditions. So, the Gupta Empire was called the Golden Age of India. A lot of progress was made when it came to intellectual innovations. So much like the Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empire expanded through military conquest, though they were never as large as the Mauryan rulers. And part of that is because the Gupta brought northern and central India together, but not the south. And like the Mauryan Empire, um, the Guptas controlled iron deposits, they established state monopolies, and they collected a 25% agricultural tax. The Guptas used their army to control the core of their empire, but provisional administration was left to governors, and often these posts were turned into hereditary positions. Because the Gupta didn't have a sufficient military force as compared to the Mauryan, they exercised power as something called a theater state. And what they did is they would redistribute profits and luxury goods that were brought in from trade. And they would pass these out to their dependents who were living outside of the capital in exchange for gifts and other favors, including loyalty. We don't have a lot of archeological data and a few contemporary accounts from which to actually learn about politics society, and culture of the Gupta period. We know the court itself supported mathematics and astronomy, and that Gupta mathematicians invented what would later be called the Arabic numerals, as well as the concept of zero. Gupta rulers also supported literary endeavors. We know that the Chinese monk Fashian traveled through the Gupta empire, and this is how we have a lot of this information. Um, Historians also believe that the first vaccine for a certain virus was actually developed in the Gupta. And how this came about is doctors in the Gupta empire realized that if they, and I, don't, I don't know how, how you figure this out, but they realized if they took a needle and they dipped it into an active pox of a person, and then they poked another individual with that same needle, the individual would develop a very mild case of this virus, but they would be able to fight it off. And after that, they became immune. And this virus would later be called smallpox. Um, so the first vaccine for smallpox actually came about in India. Unfortunately, that knowledge would be lost when the Gupta Empire fell. During the Gupta period, we do know a lot about women in terms of the rights that they lost under the Gupta. And regardless of their, well, I should say regardless of their husband's social class, women were treated like the lowest Varna called the Shudra. We know that these women were married very young. And in some places, a widow was actually required to burn herself on her husband's funeral pyre. And this will be a tradition called sati. Among the very few ways to escape the slow status was to join a religious community, to be a member of an extremely wealthy family, or to be a courtesan. As in, as in Greece and China, this change in women's status followed an increase in urbanization and the growth of a non-agricultural property-owning middle class. And these people could have been merchants, artisans, soldiers, or minor royalty, or even in the priest class. The Gupta period, while dominated by Hinduism, was characterized by religious toleration, and it saw the development of the classic form of Hindu temples with exterior courtyards, inner shrines, and wall decorations. 
On the other hand, the Gupta period saw the Brahmin class regain power, influence, and wealth. Gupta India was linked to the outside world by an extensive trade network. Trade with Southeast and East Asia in particular flourished. In 1550 CE, the Gupta Empire collapsed under the financial burden of defense against the Huns. India would then slowly decentralize and it would develop a feudal economic and social structure. During the decline of the Gupta, numerous small kingdoms would rise up. Sorry for the delay, guys, my computer froze. Um, all right, so we're on Southeast Asia. Um, and I do want you just to take a minute to look at the map of Southeast Asia. Knowing geography is gonna be a very important skill, area of knowledge, whatever you wanna call it to have in this class, because a lot of questions that you're gonna be asked in terms of essays, they're not specifically gonna ask you on an empire or a kingdom when it comes to trade. It's gonna talk about regions or compare East and Southeast or South and East Asia. And you never wanna be the person that gets countries in those regions mixed up and then write about it in an essay. It's a way to lose points really quickly. Um, but let's take a look at Southeast Asia. You need to know about the geographical time zones as well as the natural resources. And one of their greatest resources is both fertile agricultural lands, but also the monsoon rains. And these combined lead to several growing seasons a year, which allowed them to support a very large, dense population. So let's take a look at Surabaya. Um, this was located on Sumatra, and it dominated the trading routes throughout the Strait of Malacca, as well as the area of what would be known as Malaysia and Indonesia. The political system knit together four different ecological zones, and all of this is consolidated under one king. So this kingdom would be built upon trade, and kings maintained their power over this complex system through a combination of military power, diplomacy, control of trade, and the techniques of the theater state taken from the Gupta. Kings used the splendor of their capital to attract resources and labor. Um, they also patronized Buddhist monasteries and schools. Culture from India was exercised as a powerful influence, specifically in the government. And in addition to Buddhism, Hindu religions became the dominant faiths in this region. So just take a look. So as you can see, we're gonna talk about Indian Ocean trade later on. And this is actually going to be how this entire region not just survives, but thrives. And this kingdom actually arose because as they develop, as you can see, there are a number of fantastic ports for Indian Ocean trade. And there was another kingdom called the Kingdom of Funan. And unintentionally, <laughs> when Sarave arose, Funan collapsed because that was just one stop, maybe one or two ports, and that was it. Here, we see plenty. I do want to talk to you about Angkor Wat as well. Um, so this was originally constructed as a Hindu temple for the Khmer Empire um, in present day Cambodia. Now, this temple was dedicated to Vishnu and we talked about religion spreading from India into these regions, and this actually transformed from a Hindu temple into a Buddhist temple in the 14th century. And it is the largest religious structure in the world that still operates as a religious structure. And our last topic for today is about Islam in South and Southeast Asia, and we will be talking more about this later on. Between 1206 and 1236, the divided states of Northwest India were defeated by Muslim Turkish conquerors under the leadership of Sultanate Tumish, who would then establish the Delhi Sultanate as a Muslim state. Although the Muslim elite settled down to rule India relatively peacefully, there remained some tension between themselves and their Hindu subjects. And Tumish would actually pass his throne to his daughter, Rizaya, um, which was unheard of. His daughter became the ruler, and she was incredibly talented. She was very smart, but 
she was driven off the throne by men in her court who were unwilling to accept a female monarch, and unfortunately, she was assassinated. What we would see under the Delhi Sultanate is a policy of religious tolerance toward Hindus. Um, unfortunately, that policy would be re reversed later on as the Delhi Sultanate continued their expansion. Um, what we would see in the Delhi Sultanate, as well as other regions that were ruled by um, or by Muslim leaders, is something called the jizya, which was a tax that non-Muslims had to pay their Muslim rulers. Um, but I want you to think about this for a minute. Nobody is is forcing anyone to convert. Nobody is being killed because they won't convert. They have to pay a tax and through our, our modern day approach, we see that as something awful. It's repressive. But in the time period that we're looking at, this is what religious freedom looked like. You had to pay a tax and, and that was it. And that's going to be something that we're going to take a look at throughout this class is using religion as a tool of political authority. Um, sometimes for good and sometimes for not so good. Um, thanks for listening, guys. Have a great night.